Good morning. Welcome to Math 261 Vector Calculus Delta College. This is Thursday, September 9 class session. And our major topics for today, I'm going to finish up a couple of important points about the dot product, talk about the cross product, and then lines and planes. Right now we're focusing on where we are in space and how to describe where we are in space. So the key concepts are distance, angle, and basic geometric figures. And after we're able to describe effectively where we are in space, then we can start to talk about moving in space and get into the next chapter where we talk about space curves. That's gonna be really important. You have to know where you are before you can describe to someone where you're going. So the key concepts here about the dot product, I want to reiterate what projection is. I want to show you the value of the direction cosines. And then we'll move in to the second attempt at multiplication. You realize how the dot product and cross product went together? With our notion of vector, we were able to describe location and distance very well. We were able to add and scale vectors, add, subtract, and scale vectors, but we didn't multiply vectors. So we have two attempts to multiply vectors, dot product, cross product. Both of them fail to be multiplications, maybe in your traditional real number sense of multiplications, but they both serve a useful purpose. So we call them the dot product, cross product, and we show you their major features, dot product, and the cross product. Cross product is excellent for describing area and volume. And together, the dot product and the cross product cement our notion of distance that we're going to talk about lines and planes in space. <coughs> the dot product had a superpower. And the superpower of the dot product was in determining angles. We'll remind you of the formula. But the dot product had a super detractor. And that's a little bit overly dramatic. But the dot product, when I dotted two vectors, returned to me a real number. And so it didn't return to me a vector. So you could say that's a shortcoming of the dot product, but we easily overlooked it because of its power in determining angle. The cross product likewise has a superpower and its superpower is determining area. And unlike the dot product, when you take the cross product of two vectors, you do give birth to a vector. So that sounds a little more promising. Maybe this is a true multiplication. But if you've used the dot product before, as you'll see today when we execute it, it does have a super detractor. It does have a fault. And the fault is that three times five is not five times three. Well, among numbers, three times five is five times three. But among the cross product, when you cross two vectors, u cross v is not the same as v cross u. And that's called commutativity. So the cross product is not commutative. So now we're going to talk about lines and planes in space after we have these weapons. If you have any questions, you can throw them in the chat and we'll answer them. Uh, you have asked some very excellent questions so far, and I've put up additional videos or solutions as you've asked them. I think the theme, and I'm going to start there today, among your questions is the power of the unit vector. And the power of direction. So never forget every vector. is 
the product of its length and its direction. You'd be surprised how many times you're discussing vectors and that sentence alone solves the problem for you or does the problem for you. So if I write that in a mathematical sentence, every vector is the product of its magnitude or its length and its direction. Magnitude, length, some people call this norm. And so therefore, when you create the direction of a vector, some people say that you're norming the vector or normalizing the vector. But this is a very powerful statement right here. Product in the sense of scaling, but we'll forgive the use of the word product right there. Okay, so let's recap some important points about the dot product. So if we have a vector V right here, and make sure when you talk about a vector V, you distinguish between talking about the vector and the direction of the vector. You know, those are two different things. A vector has length and direction. So when you talk about distance, you're talking about length. When you talk about the vector's direction, you're talking about the direction of the vector right there. Make sure you understand in any problem, whether they're talking about the vector itself, its direction, or its length. If I decompose that into a right angle, and by the way, I could put a right angle on this vector in many, many places. I'm just choosing to place it as it looks horizontally and vertically. And I call that angle between one of these sides theta. Never forget your trigonometry, tell you what these two sides are equal to. We could derive it, but I think I'm just gonna write it. V cosine theta, mag V cosine theta, mag V sine theta. All right, so as soon as I write that, remember the ratio of the horizontal, the adjacent angle, the angle, the adjacent side to the angle to the length itself has to be cosine theta. So the ratio of this side to this side you see is cosine theta. The ratio of the opposite side to the length is sine theta. But the way that that helps us out is now let's take an entirely different context where I have a vector V and then another vector in space called W. Now I'm not talking about one direction, I'm talking about two directions. And you'd like to have a discussion about this vector relative to that vector. How are these two vectors related? Well, the very first way you can relate them is called decomposition. How much of vector V lies along W and how much of vector V has really nothing to do with W. So take this right angle that I drew, it looks like especially horizontally and vertically, right? But now take that right angle and drop it on W. Project, this is called projection. Project V onto W. So put that right angle right here. And this vector that I just drew on top of W, is called the projection of V onto W. And it's given the notation, projection of V onto W, a little W subscript vector V right here. I could describe for you exactly how to determine that shadow vector. 
if I look at this direction over here. So how long is that shadow vector? Well, again, let's take this angle right here. Let's call this angle theta, like I was transcribing this triangle over to here. How long is that green vector? The green vector is mag V cosine theta long. And that takes a bite out of W, like W was 10 units long. And this green vector might be four units long. But describing the length of the green vector, describing the length of this projection vector, and describing the projection vector itself are two different things. So how do I describe the projection vector? I know how long the projection vector is. What then do I lack? I lack the direction of the projection vector. And the direction of the projection vector so I'm going to say that very explicitly. It's the length of the projected vector and the direction of the projected vector is what? The same direction as W. So the direction of the projected vector Excuse me, I move the paper up. Is the direction of W. So let's put these two things together because as I promised, every vector is the product of its length and direction. So the direction of the projected vector is the same as the direction of W. So if I put these two things together, here is the length of the shadow vector. Here is the direction of the shadow vector. And together, this must be the projection of V onto W. But this is a somewhat unwieldy formula. So let's clean it up. What's the key to cleaning up? Cosine of theta. Because we know that the cosine of theta is described by the dot product of the two vectors divided by the magnitude of the two vectors. So if we insert this in here, then we get magnitude v, u dot v, magnitude v, magnitude w, and the third piece, the direction, w over mag w. This is the actual projection of v onto w. And now you notice that we get to clean some things up. The mag v's cancel out. And you can use the superpower of the dot product that any vector dotted with itself is the same as the magnitude of that vector squared. So when I say mag w times mag w, mag w squared, remember any vector dotted with itself is the same as the magnitude of that vector squared. Then we get kind of the slick, easy to remember formula for projection of V onto W. This is the formula you see presented in text and executed in practical circumstances. U dot V, excuse me, I keep saying V, and I keep saying U, but my vectors in question were V and W, right? So let's go clean that up. V, W, V, W. Where did I insert this U dot V? It was actually V dot W. My fault. V 
dot w. So v dot w over w dot w times w. This is the formula for the shadow vector that v casts on w. Sometimes people shorten this and call it v parallel or v parallel to w. V parallel and this leftover piece, they shorten to V perp. What part of V has nothing to do with W? What part of V is neutral with respect to W? It neither goes along W or against W. And that's the V perp. How do I find the formula for V perp? Well, I say I have a formula for this shadow vector. I have a formula for the original. If I take the original minus the shadow, then I have the vector that's perpendicular. So V perp to W is a V minus the projection of V onto W. Okay. So I did that rather deliberately, but it shows a couple of useful things. Again, it showed the power of direction. It showed that when I'm referring to a triangle right there, I can refer to the triangle in an arbitrary orientation. And now I can decompose any vector along any other vector. Now, do you notice that V this time is kind of pointing in the direction of W or the shadow that V casts on W is pointing in the direction of W? It doesn't have to be like that. The shadow that V casts on W could be pointing in the opposite direction. And then the decomposition, the shadow will be over here, projection of V onto W, and the perpendicular portion will be on this side. But my formula discovers that. Why does my formula discover that? Because if V and W are separated by more than 90 degrees, then what happens to the cosine? Cosine becomes negative. And when the cosine is negative, then this factor cosine theta will direct the shadow to the other side of W. It'll make the shadow point in the other side of W. Okay, that's the first thing we need to remember about the dot product. Now let's talk about direction cosines literally. Because in some problems that you've asked, these have come up in a useful way. So we indicate direction by vector divided by its magnitude. So this is our most noble sense of direction. But sometimes people like to orient themselves with respect to another direction or orient themselves with respect to a line or another frame of reference. So I don't wanna to totally throw out the notion of angle. Sometimes I use the notion of angle. So let's pick a vector right here and let's go a little bit out in the X direction. A little bit out in the Y direction. And then up here, let's go a fair way up in the Z direction. So this is another way I could denote angle. So I have a vector coming out of the paper at you like this. Let's call that vector V. And by our previous discussion, by the discussion we just finished, the projection discussion, this vector casts a shadow on the X, Y, and Z axes. And we know that shadow to be if you want me to say it this way, 
Vx, Vy, and Vz in length. So these are the readings, Vx, real numbers, Vy. And careful how you draw this shadow right here. So if I think about the shadow cast in the plane and I try to bring it up exactly the same way here, try to draw these two lines parallel, that will locate what? Easy. But how do I discover these three angles? What is the angle between the x-axis and that vector? Let's call it alpha. What is the angle between the y-axis and that vector? Let's call it beta. And what is the angle gamma between the z-axis and that vector? Well, think of these right triangles that you have here. From the tip of this vector to this point on the y-axis, it's very hard to draw in perspective, but think of that as a tilted right angle. So let me extract this right angle and lay it on the table. Y-axis. Vector V. And this distance right here is the distance Vy. The angle right here is the angle beta. And what should I do to determine what Vy is? Remember, if I talk about the length of this hypotenuse, the length of this right triangle, this right triangle is the same as the right triangle right here, then Vy must be mag V cosine beta. But if I do that for all three of these right triangles, and the, and the, the picture is going to get too destroyed if I do that, but picture another right triangle up here, terminating on VZ, and then very tilted right triangle here, terminating on VX. In other words, repeat this diagram with VX and alpha and VZ and gamma. Well, all I'm gonna do is discover that Vx is mag V cosine alpha, Vy is mag V cosine beta, and Vz is mag V cosine gamma. When I insert these three conditions into this vector, what do I see? The vector V, let's factor out the common factor of mag V, is cosine alpha, cosine beta, cosine gamma. And now we have the magic of length times direction. Remember? Every vector, sorry, I've got to say V and mag V right here. So I'm a little loose with my letters. Every vector is the product of its length and its direction. If that is the length, that must be the direction of V. This must be V over mag V. You're kind of underwhelmed by that. Like, okay, so what? Well, if this is the direction of V, what's the direction of V satisfy? It's a one unit long vector, right? So when you square, 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 add square root, square, 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 add the three squares and then square root the result, the result has to be one because this is length one vector. So you get this famous identity about alpha, beta, and gamma. Which is just a restatement really of the Pythagorean theorem in three dimensions. This says if you square the cosine of alpha and square the cosine of beta and square the cosine of gamma in this picture, 
then you get one and the square root of one is one. So for that purpose, that this is the direction of V and these three cosines are the cosines of the angles that separate V from the axes. These are called the direction cosines. And the angles, alpha, beta, and gamma are called the direction angles. So this is another way you could orient yourself in space. So that was the last thing I wanted to say about the dot product. Uh, you still are suffering from this one idea like, Okay, I believe all that, but what am I going to do with it? So what I want you to do is understand that soon, instead of orienting ourselves with respect to X, Y, and Z, we could orient ourselves with respect to many frames of reference. In fact, we're going to have to very soon when we describe curves in space. Think of a plane, think of a spaceship, think of a satellite. Well, it's all very well and good if you're driving a car on the surface of the earth, if you're flying a plane close to the surface of the earth, then you have a horizontal, you have a vertical, you have a natural frame of reference produced by gravity. But without that frame of reference, you're in serious trouble. This is what happens when you fly an airplane at night and you can't see the horizon. It's what happened to John F. Kennedy Jr. Go look that up. So you sometimes need to create your own frame of reference. A satellite in space, okay, it's under a gravitational force, but once that satellite, spaceship, capsule, whatever leaves the gravitational force of the Earth, what's its frame of reference? Well, we're gonna discover that any path in space so I mean this to be some kind of wiggly thread in three-dimensional space. Well, of course, we're standing on the earth observing this spaceship. We have a frame of reference, but if you're flying around on that spaceship, you can't be always looking over your shoulder to see what the frame of reference is to the people that you left back on earth. Well, I'm being a little bit humorous right there, but what I'm trying to say is that every path naturally creates its own three-dimensional frame of reference. So any vectors, not just I, J, and K, any three vectors that are one unit long and mutually perpendicular form a three-dimensional frame of reference. But while you're following a path in space, you can create other arbitrary frames of reference. Three mutually perpendicular vectors that you could give arbitrary names to. And then these direction cosines do what? Measure your deviation from that local frame of reference. So I want you to open your mind and not just relate to the standard frame of reference, Pretty soon, we're going to have to define our own local frames of reference. And then these direction cosines you might see in a heads up display on any kind of flying object, then these direction cosines might have value beyond what we've presented so far.
Okay. And I don't want to get into aeronautics and things like that quite yet. So let's just leave it at that right now. Okay, now we present formally the cross product. We loved the dot product, even though it didn't produce a vector. And so it's just a minor annoyance that when you dotted two vectors, you didn't get a vector back. But let's have a stab at smashing two vectors together and getting a vector in return. And this is called the cross product. And it works like this. If you have two vectors, u and v, this is in space. Now, I'm specifically right now talking about three-dimensional space. I don't often restrict myself, but right here, I'm gonna restrict myself. So these vectors I'm drawing in three-dimensional space. Let's call this one u. Let's call this one v. And let's say u, again, now this is respect to the standard frame of reference, has coordinates u, u1, and u2, or u1, u2, and u3. And v has coordinates v1, v2. Yeah, don't describe vector coordinates with vectors themselves. v1, v2, and v3. And here's a crazy, crazy convolution of u and v. You should be careful when I use the word convolution because you're going to have to talk about convolution in future math class. So I present you the shorthand, and then I'll write out the formula. I, J, and K is a reference to the standard frame of reference. U cross V, U1, U2, U3. And V, V1, V2, V3. I don't know what your experience is with matrices or determinants. And I don't want to scare you with any of those words. But a matrix is just a rectangular array of numbers. What I've presented here is a rectangular array with three rows and three columns. The u1, u2, u3, v1, v2, v3 are numbers. The i and the j and the k are not numbers. The i and j and k are the standard directions along the x, y, and z axis. But if I use this as a notation to represent this expression, u2, u3, v2, v3, minus, U1, U3, V1, V3, plus U1, U2, V1, V2, with the directions I, J, and K. What I'm specifying, let's be very, very crude. I'm smashing together the vectors U and V, and I'm producing another vector. This is clearly another vector because it's got a direction, it's got a component in the i direction, a component in the j direction, a component in the k direction, mind the negative sign. I tell you what these two by two matrices produce. This is u2 v3 minus u3 v2 in the i direction. This is the opposite of u1 v3 minus u3 v1 in the j direction. And this is plus u1 v2 minus u2 v1 in the k direction. Presented without the i, j, and k, I could write this vector as u2 v3, now you're not gonna often write it out 
in all these details, you're just going to calculate it, minus U3V2 subtract, very important, you forget, don't forget that sign, U1V3 minus U3V1, and then plus U1V2 minus U2V1. So I've presented this horrible mixing up of U and V right here. If I wrote this formula down just as it is and maybe incorporated that minus sign into my work, it'd be like crazy impossible to memorize this because you always forget where the twos and the threes and the ones go and you put things out of order and you get in trouble, right? So this is called the cross product of U and V. But the presentation is shortened into this representation of a three by three array, a three by three matrix. And these absolute value bars represent the determinant of that matrix. Really to do this, you only need to know what a two by two matrix is and what the determinant of a two by two matrix is. You take the product of the main diagonal minus the product of the so-called off diagonal. Two diagonals, product of the main diagonal starting from the upper left minus the product of the off diagonal, the remaining two numbers. That's all I did when I calculated these things. Now, you know, that's a little too crazy to absorb. So let's do an actual example. Let's say U is this very mellow, one, two, minus one. Let's say V is two, three, zero, one. So I'm not gonna pick challenging numbers at all. Let's do the cross product of U and V. Now the cross product of U and V you can execute in a calculator, you can execute in Mathematica. In fact, that reminds me, I wanna show you some things in Mathematica this morning. But if I wrote it out according to that definition, I would write I, J, K, vector hats. And then I write in order, U in the next row and V in the next row and take the determinant. Now I'm gonna do that just visually. And that is the I portion comes from blocking out the I row and the I column and taking the determinant of the remaining two by two, which is two minus zero. That's determinant as I described it up here. And two minus zero is two. The J component comes from crossing out the J column and the J row, so to speak, and taking the remaining two by two, two by two determinant here, which is one minus negative three, one minus negative three, one plus three is four, but the J slot, we take the opposite. And the third component of the cross product comes from crossing out the third column and the K row right there and take this determinant, which is zero minus six. Zero minus six is negative six. This is the cross product of U and V. Well, so what? You know, what am I going to do with this? Well, the first thing I want you to notice about U cross V, go back to U and V up here. Do you notice that when you dot U? with u cross v, what do you get? One times two, two times minus four, minus one times minus six. You get two plus negative four plus, I'm sorry, two plus negative eight plus six. Two plus negative eight plus six, you get zero. 
What does dot product zero mean? 90 degrees separation. Let's try V dot U cross V. V appears three zero one dot six zero minus six. It's also zero. So U cross V is what? Perpendicular to both U and V. Come back up to my picture and try to draw that. I wanna draw a vector that's perpendicular to both U and V. Now check this out. It's like U and V form a table, form a flat surface, two dimensional vector, forms a plane sheet of paper containing those two vectors. But U cross V is automatically perpendicular to both of them. Now you complain in my drawing, you did a crummy job of making it perpendicular to V. Uh, maybe I'll give you a pass on perpendicular to you. No, no, no. Remember my drawings in three dimensions. So I claim I drew a beautifully, perfectly perpendicular to U and V. How do I get away with that? Just put in the right angle markers. Now, do you see that this is a perfect 90 degree angle? That's cheating, of course, isn't it? But these right angle markers remind you that this might be oriented in space in a different way. So U and V form tabletop, U cross V is a vertical vector coming out of that table, like a tree or a building, perfectly vertically oriented. So in a way, U cross V is the beginnings of a frame of reference. So U cross V is naturally perpendicular to U and V, but it's got another superpower. I reproduce the drawing now, but since I have no particular bias as to direction or anything like that, let me reproduce the different colors here. I'll pay. U this time oriented that way, V this time oriented that way. And then I'm gonna draw the vector U cross V way over here. And again, you say, wow, uh, that doesn't look perpendicular to V, but maybe it's kind of perpendicular to you. You can see that. But if I put in the right angle marker, in perspective. Now you see it's also perpendicular to V. So this is U cross V. Here's the second superpower of U cross V. Now uh, every vector has a length, right? So U cross V has a length. Magnitude or length of U cross V. But now let's look at the tabletop created by U and V. Remember U and V is like a giant plane. And what if I did my parallelogram law right here? I'll draw the parallelogram that's created by U and V. I want you to imagine that parallelogram there. That parallelogram has area, right? It's the floor of a room. It may not be that U and V are perpendicular. This could be some kind of sheared room, right? Not right angle walls. I didn't say that U and V are at right angles. See, I didn't make a mark for U and V being at right angles, but this parallelogram has area. And it happens that the area of the parallelogram 
is always the same as the magnitude of the U cross V. So if we want to discover the area of this parallelogram, all we have to do is cross these two vectors and take their length. Let's do it another way. Let's say here's U, let's say here's V. I'm gonna stop messing with the colors in a second. And let me draw a couple more pictures before we take a break. What if I looked at the triangle made by U and V? So here's U, here's V. What about this area of this triangle? Well, you know what I'm about to say. This triangle is half of the parallelogram, right? So the area of this triangle is one half U cross V. Let's do a short demo before I take a break. What if I gave you points in space, A, B, and C, and any arbitrary points in space like uh, seven, one, minus one, two, zero, four, and uh, I don't know, minus one, one, three. Now I picked these numbers at random, so this is gonna be kind of crazy, right? Like, I don't know if I'm gonna get easy calculation or hard calculation here. Now I'm also gonna represent this very casually. I'm not gonna count these units, but if I went way out on the x-axis and then one and then down one on the z-axis, that might be A. Likewise, two, no y-axis, four up. Well, that might be a representation of B. And then back one, out one, up three, that might be a representation of C. Now you know that three points in space make a triangle. And now I ask you for the area of triangle ABC. Well, area of triangle in general, if you're laying it in the plane, well, you've got all kinds of formulas for that, right? But this triangle is not laying in the plane. This triangle is in perspective. So what I need to do is use this superpower of the cross product. So let's call this vector AB. Let's call this vector AC. If I take the cross product of AB and AC and then take its mag, I'll get double that triangle's area. I'll be very careful. Here's points and here's vectors, right? So AB from A to B is minus five units, minus one unit and plus five units. That's going from A to B, minus five, minus one, plus five. What is it to go from A to C? Minus eight, no direction, no motion in the Y direction, and plus four. From minus one to three is plus four. Now let's execute AB cross AC. Now I'm gonna be really casual about this and do it myself right here. And notice how I wrote AB on top of AC. So I could imagine that there's a little IJK right here. And then I could do my cover up determinant cross out thing. So here's a speech I'm gonna give you. Calculator, no calculator is built that doesn't have a cross product and dot product already in it. Any kind of computer algebra system automatically will calculate cross products and dot products for you. We'll show you in a second. So here's my promise to you. I don't care how you calculate dot product and cross product. I just care that you're never wrong. And I'm frequently wrong. So do as I say, not as I do. Let's do the cross product. It's casually right here, cross out the I. This is negative four minus zero. Cross out the J, 
This is negative 20 minus negative 40. Negative 20 plus 40 is what? Negative 20 plus 40 is 20, but the J slot is the opposite. And here we take the determinant, zero minus positive eight, zero minus positive eight is negative eight. Now I surely hope this is right. Let's work on the assumption right now that I did the cross product correctly. We can pull up a calculator, we can pull up the machine and test it. But now I want the area of that triangle, right? So I'm gonna mag this. I'm not gonna rewrite it. I'm just gonna throw the mag bars on it. And then I'm gonna take half of that. Magging this is 16,464. Square rooted. So this is 80,480. Square rooted. And now I can do, oh, I don't know, all kinds of things to take, like what's the perfect squares inside here. And certainly there's a four in here. And certainly there's a 16 in here. I think this is 16 times 30. And 16 is four root 30. So square root of 16 is four. So now, oh, I gotta pull out a calculator. Not because I need an approximation, but whenever you're doing a physical problem, you kind of like to feel what the approximation is. So four times the square root 30. What do we got here? 21.9 approximately divided by two. The area of the triangle ABC equals one half of that cross product ABAC. And so this is on the order of 10.95. Well, 11 if I went to the same, if I went to the same precision. That's not anything that you should throw away lightly, right? Because you would have had a heck of a time working out the area of this triangle differently. If it was a right triangle, you know, you could do base times height, but how do you work out the base and the height of this? You'd have to kind of orient yourself. You'd have to use some kind of measuring devices, right? Well, the cross product is a measuring device. The cross product is a measuring device which tells me area. So glue this into your mind. Superpower of the cross product. Its magnitude is the same as the area of this little floor tile that you and V create. And so the area of the triangle is half the floor tile. Now be very careful when you talk about length, you might talk about units like meters or feet or inches. But when you talk about area, it must be square units, square feet, square meters, square inches. So if you're doing a physical problem and you say the magnitude is five meters, you will not report to me that the area of the parallelogram is five meters. No one would take you seriously. But if the area, if the length of this vector is 350 feet, then the area of this parallelogram is 350 square feet. 10 inches? 10 square inches, 13 meters, 13 square meters. Okay, so make sure you use area and length in the appropriate fashion. Okay, there's one other superpower that the cross product has. What are the three superpowers? It's naturally perpendicular to U and V. Its magnitude or length has a special property with respect to area. And there's one more now that we're gonna cover after the break. So let me number this paper. Let me take a break. And what reason I'm doing that is gonna pull up a Mathematica notebook when we come back. And 
show you a quick introduction to Mathematica. And maybe repeat some of the calculations we just did in the machine. See if I can visualize this a little bit better than I could draw it. And the answer is, yeah, all visualizations have shortcomings. So let's come back at, let's try, uh, what, five minutes from now? Let's call it 9.03. And wherever you are in Mathematica, I'm going to give you this morning just a short tour to show you how to operate it generally. I'm going to mute my mic while I stretch my legs. You can do the same, but I'll be back in five minutes.
Okay, we're back. And we'll start out with this little correction or apology because I have to be very careful when I'm setting this up. Sometimes I forget to record. That would be a worse error. But I did not have my paper pinned to the recording while we went through the first hour. Now you could have the paper on your screen, but I didn't have it under the recording button. My apologies. On the other hand, you have the recording, which will be audio with just my beautiful fractal on it, but you also have the notes that we've written. So you can consume the first hour of the recording by using the notes and using the audio. But now I've got this paper pinned to the recording. So I try to avoid mistakes like that, but Sometimes I forget, I apologize. Uh, I'll go on my website in a second and show you, remind you where you find the audio video recordings and the copies of the notes. Okay, one more. Dot cross product superpower. And that is the dot product and the cross product interact excellently. They interact in the arithmetical sense with distributive laws and such, and they present that in the book, but they interact in a beautiful geometric way. Now for that, I'm gonna ditch the color coding right here because you know that takes extra time to add. But let's say that I had a vector three vectors in space, let's say, I could name them U, V, and W. I will write names on them, but I wanna finish my drawing before I do that. So these are any three vectors in space, U, V, and W. And in the same way, two vectors determine a sheet of paper or a plane, as long as they're not on top of each other, then they only determine a line. But three vectors, unless they lay in the same plane or on the same line, three vectors bite out a chunk of space, don't they? So let me try to draw that. And I'll show you a better drawing in a second, both human and computer. So if I extend the parallelograms of each pair of vectors, gently and carefully, what I produce is a little box in space. Now I can write names on here since I have room to work. Here's U, here's V, and here's W. And this box, this rectangular box, oh, I can't say it's rectangular, right? Because these might not be 90 degree angles. But this box is called a parallelopiped. I can't spell and speak at the same time. So first, let me write the name, parallelopiped, and you can practice pronouncing it, parallelopiped. And this is some kind of fundamental volume in space. Is it a crystal? Is it a box? Is it a sheared box? You can use all kinds of descriptive language to help you visualize this. But your first question is, how much space does it bite out? And it's a beautiful interaction of the dot product and the cross product. If you take U cross V and dot it with W. Now by dotting it, remember dot can go on either side. So I could put dotted with W on this side. 
or I could put Dante with W on that side. And I create the volume of that box. I got to be a little bit careful because dot products can be positive or negative, right? So legally, I have to take the absolute value. Let's look at what we're creating here. U cross V is a vector. And a vector dotted with a vector is a real number, positive or negative, and the absolute value signs make it positive. So this is the volume of a parallelopiped. determined by the adjacent vectors u, v, and w. But the cool thing is, is it depends on your perspective. Like u, v is the floor and w is poking out of the floor. Well, you could have said v and w is the floor and u is poking out of the floor created by v and w or v is the poking out from the floor of u and w. So you can run this formula in any variation of u, v, and w you like, as long as you include u, v, and w each once, one dot product, one cross product, and the absolute values. You could take, oh, v cross w dotted with u. As long as you take the absolute value. So you could have any mixture of those three you like in any directions. You could have U V cross W dotted with you or W cross V dotted with you. Okay, so this is a very important power of the dot product cross product combination. Now let me add one thing to this drawing. I did not say, notice I'm not saying that W is the cross product of U and V, right? So the cross product of U and V lives somewhere else. Let's take the cross product of U and V and write it here. Now I want you to talk about how area and volume interact. Remember, U cross V magnitude is the area of the floor tile created by U and V. Right? This floor tile right here. And now I've kind of crossed out V. So I'll write V back into the picture. But U cross V dotted with W, absolute value, is the volume of the parallelopiped. So there has to be a relationship between area and volume. This is a kind of a sheared fish tank. How much water does it hold? Remember, volume in general is base times height for a rectangular solid. And I'll make this more formal in a second. But if mag u cross v is base and absolute value of u cross v dot w is volume. Let's put them on opposite sides right here. u cross v dotted with w is volume. And mag u cross v is base area. then I've just discovered a way to find the height of that box. Now the height of that box, 
would be absolute value u cross v dot with w divided by mag u cross v. And that's not the only useful thing about this image. Think about this. What should be the height of this box? Since u cross v is perpendicular to both u and v, right? I could use u cross v as the measuring stick. I could translate the height of this onto the measuring stick u cross v. I could call this length the height. My drawing's getting a little bit cluttered right now, but what is the height of this object right here? Well, think about the angle between u and v as being theta. Yeah, I discover my drawing is way too cluttered, right? Let's think about what the area is. Let's lay u and v on the tabletop. And here's the angle theta. Area is traditionally base length times height. I could call it length times height, but this is height of the box and length of the box. And the length of this, or the length of this box is mag u. And the height of this box is what with respect to theta? Mag v sine theta. So the area of this parallelogram, I could also describe as u mag v mag times the sine of theta. I apologize, I'm using my phone for my camera. And then I'm going to try to call the phone. So I got to give up on that and bring my phone back into the meeting so I can go recording. Excuse me. So I should disable phone calls. Why? We're doing this meeting. That's going to mess with the recording further. So we'll have to deal with that. Oh, let's try it again. So I can represent the magnitude of u cross v as mag u mag v sine theta. How does that help me? Remember? The cosine of theta was u dot v over mag u mag v. So here's another kind of symmetry between the dot product and cross product. Cross product magnitude is mag u mag v sine theta. And the dot product, if I multiply by mag u mag v, the dot product is mag u mag v sine theta. So I want you to notice u dot v can be written as mag u mag v sine theta. And u cross v can be written as mag u, sorry, cosine theta. mag u mag v sine theta. Well, I gotta be careful about that. Cross product is not a scalar. 
So that's the magnitude of the cross product. So this is not a perfect symmetry here, but it's a kind of a useful symmetry. Okay, good. So if I put those things together, what's the height of the parallelogram? Absolute value of u cross v dotted with w divided by the mag of u cross v. But I can write the top as u cross v mag w mag times the cosine of the angle between the two. I can write the bottom as u mag v mag times the sine of the angle between them. Now this is two different angles right here. Here's the angle between W and U cross V. Let's call that theta two. It was the original angle, it's called theta one. So this on the bottom is theta one, and this on the bottom, on the top is theta two. I could use this U cross V mag to cancel out the U cross V mag there. And then I just have W times the cosine of theta two for the height. If I take this to cross out this, then the height of that box is W times the cosine of theta two, which is the natural use of the cosine. I got to get this back that interrupted my pinning. I'm sorry. So what's the natural height of this box? H? Well, it's the shadow that W cast on U cross V. Which is the magnitude of W times the cosine of the angle between V and W. Don't forget I have to put absolute value bars on this because the cosine of theta two could be negative. So I have to legally put absolute value bars on that. So this could be the height of that parallel pipe in. Let's go examine these calculations. In a brief tour of Mathematica. So I am going to share screen with you here. I'm going to go over to browser, pull up a browser here. I'm not interested in that image right now. Back to my website, semesters, calc three. So now I'm recording this browser. We're in week two. In week two, I have several Mathematica sheets that I can share with you, Mathematica notebooks, basic graphing, lines and curves and space, dot product and cross product. If you click on these, remember you go to Google Drive folder. Let me write that in terms of, excuse me, in terms of list of elements. And let's download the dot product and cross product one. Your browser doesn't understand how to represent Mathematica notebook, right? So all it's gonna let you do is download this. You click download. 
And then if you have Mathematic installed on your system, you can open that file. At the sharing other window with you now, I think I'm going to share my entire desktop so I can show you something else. So let's stop that browser sharing and let's go share the whole desktop here. So this is a Mathematica notebook. I think I will make the letters a little bit larger so you can see them better. And I'm sharing my screen for a particular purpose. Ordinarily, I would just share the window. So I'm trying to introduce you to Mathematica with some very gentle calculations here. And Mathematica has elements like text windows describing what we're doing. It has input lines. You see a little blinking cursor under my name. That's automatically an input line where I can type something like two plus three and hit shift return and Mathematica responds two plus three is five. The two plus three and the five, do you see the in and the out here? These are called cells. And it's called in one and out one because that was the first input cell and the first output cell in this notebook. Over here, the cells are blocked off with brackets. I could eliminate these cells just by highlighting the bracket and deleting it. I don't need those cells right now. Here I have a title for this notebook. This is just text and a subtitle telling you that we're going to define vectors in Mathematica. Do you see that title is in a cell? And the subtitle is in a cell. And then I put a little text inside there to say a vector in Mathematica is defined as a list. And then here's a new input cell. The new input cell makes three definitions, U, V, and W. So if I put my cursor on this input cell, the input cell has three lines here. And the three lines were created just by hitting a carriage return. When I hit shift return in Mathematica, it's an instruction to Mathematica to execute that object. So if I hit shift return, I will define three vectors in Mathematica. Now Mathematica doesn't say anything back to me. It just accepts the definition. But if I ask Mathematica what U was, by saying U shift return, Mathematica would respond to me. U is the vector one, two, minus five. Notice Mathematica doesn't use pointy brackets. Mathematica naturally thinks is a vector as a list. So these are three lists, three vectors. The notation colon equals is a way of defining a variable in Mathematica. I could have also said u equals v equals w equals without the colons. Maybe I'll talk to you about the difference between colon equals and equals another time. I don't want the side conversation in here, so I just delete it. But having defined these vectors, now I can ask Mathematica to do three times u, or u minus v, or u plus 2v. Mathematica can do any of these calculations. Three times u, you see, is 3, 6, minus 15. u minus v is 3, 1, and minus 8. So you can scale, add, subtract vectors as you expect. You can measure the length and direction of a vector. For the length of a vector, Mathematica uses the command called norm. So here I have four commands I want you to understand. Norm takes the length of the vector. And the vector divided by its norm must be a unit vector. But Mathematica has a built-in command for doing unit vectors called normalize. So if I hit return on this, what I get is the length of u, which is root 30. Notice the command n bracket norm u return to me the numerical value of root 30. So when I say norm u, Mathematica responds exactly root 30. But if I wanted a numerical approximation, then I use the n bracket command. That's called numerical approximation. 
Notice if I divide any vector by its norm, Mathematica gives me an exact answer. It's not pretty, but there's a unit one vector. And normalize is also a command that immediately gives me the length one vector. So I want you to notice some things in these four commands that I gave. Do you notice that commands in Mathematica are always delimited by square brackets? You must eliminate, you must delimit commands. You must write the arguments of commands in square brackets only. That's the first mistake people are generally making. Notice you can put commands inside commands, like the numerical approximation of the norm of u, but again with square brackets. Third thing I want you to notice is the internal commands in Mathematica, norm, n, normalize, they're always capitalized. A command in Mathematica, an internally defined command is always capitalized and delimited by square brackets. Where can you find this information? That's why I'm sharing screen. I can go to the Wolfram documentation and it's got an extensive, powerful set of documentation. I can ask Mathematica what norm is. And Mathematica will tell me the norm gives the norm of a vector or a matrix. I can see all the technical details about this command. And I can even find examples of the command, like the norm of the complex number minus two plus i is root five. I can look up normalize. And it gives me what the normalize command does. It gives me a description of the normalized command. It gives me lots of examples. Normalize 151. Well, 151 has length root 27, right? Which is three root three. So here's the norm, normalized version of 151. The beauty of the documentation here is it gives me lots of other examples that I can practice with and work with. Okay. How about dot product and cross product? Does Mathematica do dot product and cross product? You say, yes, it does. Use the command dot and cross. You can also use short commands, u period v and u cross v, which is created in another fashion. You can look up the documentation, but here we do the dot product and cross product, shift return. The dot product of u and v is minus 15, the cross product, of u and w in that order is 18, 11, 8. Now remember the cross product of w and u is not the same thing. By the right hand rule, the cross product w is the same length, the points in the opposite direction. So cross product is not commutative. Orthogonal decomposition. Well, this gives me the power of Mathematica. I could define, and notice I'm defining with equals and not colon equals here. I could define the projection of u onto w. How do I do that? u dot w over w dot w times w. So I use the internal commands and I create a new vector called u parallel. And then I create a new vector called u perp, which is u minus u parallel. And then I'll show you that u parallel plus u perp is u, and the dot product of u parallel and u perp is zero. I do all that with the keystroke. So here's the shadow that u casts on w. Here's the leftover part or the perpendicular part. You can add those in your head, but you can also compare u, which was one, two minus five, to u parallel plus u perp, which is one to u minus five. And when you dot u parallel and u perp, notice you get zero. Mathematica is more than just a calculating device. It is also a graphical device. Now we're gonna do a lot of graphics in here. So I don't want you to get hung up on any one command I use, but you can use the commands I draw to substitute or alter them to your purposes. Here, I'm gonna visualize the vectors u and w and 
u parallel and u perp. So I'm going to construct an image to visualize u w and the decomposition u parallel and u perp. u is going to be purple, w is going to be black, u parallel is red, and u perp is going to be blue. To illustrate the tabletop or the sheet of paper containing u and w, I'm going to add a plane. Axes equals true, plot range padding equals three. We can talk about that another time. Those are called options to the graphics 3D command. And what I do is create a representation of U in purple, W in black, the shadow that U cast on W in red, and the perpendicular leftover component in blue. I realized that Mathematica is drawing this in space. And notice I can even rotate the three-dimensional space and look at it from different angles. But when I first executed the command, I might have a poor orientation like this, right? But I can rotate this box to see the orientation more usefully. How about visualizing the cross product? Let's take U and W and make U red, W blue, and the cross product black. And I'll draw a plane containing U and W. So here's a representation of U cross W. U is red, W is blue, and the cross product by the right-hand rule is this black vector. There's all kinds of issues, perhaps by scaling and so on and so forth. So I'm not saying that the box on one side is scaled the same as the box on the other side. And sometimes it's a little bit hard to manipulate this box. Let me put it in a nice three-dimensional representation. Okay, now it's kind of an orthogonal projection, but that might not be a good way to represent those vectors, right? I can calculate the angle between two vectors with a command in Mathematica called vector angle, but I can also use my formula, the inverse cosine of the dot product of u and w divided by the norm of u and w. But when Mathematica calculates angles, it's naturally using radians. So if I want a degree approximation, I have to multiply by 180 over pi and then take a numerical approximation of that. So notice the angle between u and w is arc cos of some crazy number, right? But after I take the numerical approximation, it's about 64 degrees. What about u and u cross w? Shouldn't they be perpendicular? Well, yes. Cross product is always perpendicular to the two components. So this vector should be 90 degrees. But Mathematica reports that it's pi over 2. Why? Because Mathematica reports in radians. Then I multiply by 180 over pi, take the numerical approximation, I get 90 degrees. Okay, so there's dot product and cross product calculations and some images in Mathematica. Now you can also create parallel pipette images and other things like that. I don't think I have the time to show this here, but I think I have other worksheets where I am showing it. Notice that once I downloaded this notebook onto my desktop, then this is a local version of the notebook on the desktop. If I go back to my repository in Google Drive, you can download these notebooks but you can't upload or alter them. Now that's a protection for you. That means if you screw up a notebook you're working on on your desktop, your know, worst case scenario is you could re-download it and then you won't have to worry about damaging anything I've posted or damaging anything for anyone else. Okay, so I provided these Mathematica notebooks just to help you get started in playing with Mathematica. It's not an easy learning curve. 
but this will help you get started in understanding how Mathematica works. And we're going to need it to do some visual demonstrations later of things we cannot draw easily by hand. I'm going to go back to my web page. I'm going to focus the sharing on the web page so I can show one more thing to you. So we're back on the web page. So these things that end in .nb are all Mathematica notebooks. Okay, good. So I've got some other things that I want to illustrate with you. You can play with other notebooks here. Just experiment with these and see how they generally work. Uh, this, by the way, remember, you could get the video of the class session here, although this video could be massively screwed up by those interruptions. But if you have a problem with that, remember you always have the class notes, the physical class notes that we drew. Okay, I want to do an introduction here to lines and planes in space. So I'm going to go back to my paper with our remaining time and stop sharing this website with you. And got the paper pinned. Okay. So we're still just orienting ourselves in space. But the dot product and the cross product now give us excellent tools to extend the things we know about the plane to things we know about space. Let me number this paper. And let me make this analogy with you. In the XY plane, you know pretty much all there is to know about lines because you learned that every line is determined by a quantity called slope, change in y over change in x, and any one point that's on the line, like x1 and y1. So this is a complete description of all lines in the plane. But the problem is in space, you can't do that. Because what should you take to be the slope of a line in space? Let's call this line L. Slope with respect to what? Slope with respect to the x-axis, the y-axis, the z-axis, some combination of all three? Now that's going to be awkward. What is it that characterizes a line in space? Well, it's almost like a vector. Every line in space has to have a direction. Not a length, because a line is an infinitely long object, but every vector in space has a direction. Every line in space has a unique direction, the flight of that plane. So I could specify a starting point. This time I'll use three coordinates, x1, y1, and z1. And notice that's a point, round brackets, let's call it point P. And then I could find a direction of that line. Let's call it V. Now you know how you use point and slope to make a line in the plane. So now I'll show you how to use point and direction to make a line in space. So this is my base point. This V is my direction. I have several ways I can do this, but maybe the most direct is to think about this as the flight of a plane or the driving of a train or car along a track. It's got an X, Y, and Z position component. Let's think of this as a train that goes through space, a perfectly straight line. It started somewhere, 
called x1, y1, z1. And then it left the station in this direction v, which we'll call v1, v2, v3. So the v1 is the direction I traveled or the amount of travel I did in the x coordinate, the y coordinate, the z coordinate, the v2 and the v3. So I could write v1 times time, v2 times time, and v3 times time, like this. This is called a parametric representation of line. This is the most direct way to describe a line. I use the vector direction and I use the base point to construct an image of where that plane or train is at any time. The T right here is called a parameter. And likewise, you've drawn things parameterized before in the plane, like X equals cosine T, Y equals sine T is a circle, right? You could parameterize this green line right here. I'm just describing where this train is at any given measurement of T. For example, if T equals one, then this train has traveled one V vector down the track because I'll be at X1 plus V1, Y1 plus V2, Z1 plus V3. If T is two, then I've traveled two V directions down the track. If T is minus one, then I've gone back towards the previous station. Right. So this is a way of describing a line in space. How could I describe a plane in space? Let's do a quick description of a plane in space, a sheet of paper. I could have the X, Y plane. I could have the YZ plane. I could have the XZ plane. Those are the coordinate planes. Those are easier to describe. But what if I had a sheet of paper that went through three arbitrary points? And I'm gonna represent the sheet of paper very casually as a rectangle or a parallelogram. But this plane containing points A, B, and C, it's an infinite plane, just like the line above was an infinite line. As T ranges over all real numbers, I travel infinitely far backwards and forwards on this line. When I draw the plane like this with a parallelogram, I'm not telling you that the plane stops. I'm just trying to give you an orientation or a perspective on the plane in space. Well, what is it that determines a plane? Uh, you could say very casually, a plane is determined by three points. Yes, as long as they don't lie on the same line, a plane is determined by three points. You could say a plane is determined by two vectors, right? Think of those three points as determining two vectors. And those two vectors themselves describe a parallelogram that orients that plane. But how do I describe all the points that lie on the plane? How do I describe a generic point that lies on the plane? Let's think about this logically. To lie on the plane means I have to be able to reach that point with the vectors A, B, and A, C. That's one way I could describe it. How many A, Bs should I use? Well, let's use two thirds of A, B and one and a half A, Cs. That could get me to that point, right? And that would be called a parametric representation, a little bit like I determined this train track here. Where is the station Z on this train track? Well, it's three and a half vectors V down the track. 
but I have another weapon that's gonna help me describe this plane even more effectively. I've got the cross product, AB cross AC. What could I do with the cross product? Well, with this base point A, let's call it X naught, Y naught, and Z naught. Remember, A is a point, B is a point, C is a point, A, B, and A, C are vectors. I could recognize this point on the plane. I could recognize every point on this plane as what? On a vector that's perpendicular to the cross product. So for short, let's call this cross product A, B, A, C equal to capital N. I'll use capital N to represent normal. This vector A, B cross A, C is perpendicular to the plane. It's normal to the plane, right? So let me wrap up with this formula. To be a point in this plane, what do I have to be? I have to be normal to the normal. I have to be perpendicular to the normal. How do I choose perpendicular? Well, this vector, if I call this point Q, this would be AQ, which would be X minus X naught, Y minus Y naught, Z minus Z naught, the vector. And to be perpendicular to N means that this dot product of N and AQ would be zero. So if I can describe the vector N with three components, and then I can take this cross product to make a cro AB cross AC is N, then I dot with AQ to get zero, what I create, let's say this is, I need letters and I've already used uncomfortable letters of A, B, and C for this. So let's use, and I've already used a Q right here. Let's use little a, little b, and little c for this normal vector. Little a, little b, and little c, normal vector, dotted with x minus x naught, y minus y naught, z minus z naught equals zero creates a formula a times x minus x naught b times y minus y naught and c times z minus z naught well i don't want to expand all these but i think of the minus signs right minus 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 a b c multiplied what this creates is a kind of a beautiful symmetric formula. AX plus BY plus CZ. In order to be on the plane, X, Y, and Z, AX plus BY plus CZ must equal AX naught plus BY naught plus CZ naught. So if I had a plane with a normal vector, say of three, two, and minus five, that's a normal vector. And I had the point on the plane x, y, z. Let's call that point x not y not z not. Let's call that point one, four, three. And what's the equation of the plane that's perpendicular to three, two, minus five and going through the point one, four, three? This is the a, b, and c. It is 3x plus 2y minus 5z equals what? 3 times 1, 2 times 4, and minus 5 times 3. Now that's 3 plus 8 minus 15. 3 plus 8 minus 15 is negative 4. So here is the plane in space that's perpendicular to this vector and goes through that point. Notice you can test that point. 3 plus 8 is 11, minus 15 is negative 4. This is the point 
this is the equation of the plane through 143 and perpendicular normal to the vector three, two minus five. This is a basic instruction of how to create a line and a plane in space. And there's many, many more things to creating lines and planes in space. Measuring distance, finding out how things intersect. How should two sheets of paper intersect? Well, two sheets of paper, as long as they're not the same sheet of paper, should intersect in a line. Just like two lines in the plane intersect in a point. But two sheets of paper don't necessarily have to intersect. Just like two lines in the plane don't intersect. I have to point out something else to you, and we'll do this example next time. In the plane, what can happen to two lines? If you throw two lines into a plane, two-dimensional space, they either cross or they're parallel. So if you're really unlucky and you throw two toothpicks down on the table, they might actually land on each other. How do you express this? In the plane, two lines either cross or they're parallel or they're the same. But in space, it's very different. Think about two airplanes flying in space. If you're really unlucky, the two airplanes might cross. Now, hopefully they don't cross at the same time because that would be a collision in midair. But you could have two lines in space touching at a single point. You could have two lines in space being entirely parallel. The two planes are flying side by side. You could have two planes in space tracing out the same path. Maybe they're flying the same route, but separated by an hour or two hours or a day. But in space, you have one more dimension. So you have this problem. You could have two lines that don't intersect, aren't parallel, and aren't the same. And this is called skew. Two aircraft that are traveling on entirely different paths. They don't cross the paths, they are not parallel paths, and they're not the same path. These are two lines, like the two pens in front of you, that are not ever touching. These are called skew. Okay, I've worn out my welcome, and I didn't do a great job with the recording either, so I apologize. You can scan the recording and use it as you please. But the combination of notes and recording, even with the interruptions, will still get you started here in section 2.5. I can tell you a lot more about lines and planes in space that we need to orient ourselves, but we'll save that for Tuesday. OK, you guys have a couple of problems you can work on on the weekend. Get started. Send me some questions, and I'll help you out. You've been sending me some very useful questions so far, and I've been posting videos and answers online to answer them. So continue to do that. We'll get started here. We still haven't done anything that resembles calculus, no calculating yet. But first we have to completely understand where we are in space. I'll upload this, get the video such as it is uploaded, and I'll see you again on Tuesday. Sorry for the interruptions and we'll make this better as we go along.